Corinne Bursa. Corinne? Thank you. First of all, my congratulations to both Andre and Igor for what you have achieved, what you've overcome, and the results that you're planning for your business and continued growth. I don't think I've seen a better example of resilience. How many of you and your companies have had conversations about resilience and building a more resilient business? Right? It's a big change in the way we think of supply chain. For decades, supply chain has been about cost containment. Great service at the least cost. Today, after COVID, we have all gone through a change in thought about how do we become more resilient? How do we have more supply points? Certainly cost is part of the conversation, but it's not the complete conversation. And so what I hope to share with you today are some ideas about how you can help your companies become more resilient. Now, as we were listening to the Cormatech discussion, I thought of this picture, this flower growing in the midst of nothing, right? Under duress, yet still able to find a footing and to thrive even in very difficult situations. When we think about resilience, it is the ability to anticipate and sometimes avoid negative conflict, but most of the time it's about responding, sensing the change in market conditions and responding in a positive way so that we can serve our customers, our employees, and our shareholders. But it's not easy. However, 93% of executives today say resilience is critical for business success. Increased agility in the marketplace, the ability to sense changes and respond to those changes. I'm sure nobody envisioned the magnitude of changes that your team has had to deal with. But we've all had disruptions. We've all had a change in philosophy. I mean, the reason that we plan is so that we can anticipate the future and align our business to meet those needs. People, process, technology, and data. We want to replace risky inventory with technology-driven insights. We want to augment our team, our talent, so that we can allow them to be more effective in the marketplace. But it's not easy. Some days, you probably feel like Batman, right? You are the heroes of supply chain. You are the ones that make it happen. Technology is not going to replace our talent. It is going to augment our talent. We just heard from Igor that he is challenged to make faster decisions, better decisions. We hear that time and time again. Better decisions, faster, with greater confidence. The only way we can do that is by replacing lead times with the information flow, transforming data into insight about how to effectively use our assets to meet market needs. 60% of chief supply chain officers are saying they're being pushed the same way to make better decisions faster, more consistently, and more precisely in near real time. Now, as we're doing that, most of us feel a little like this. Like the challenges are insurmountable on some days. Eric mentioned VUCA, or variability, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. We can control some of these aspects, but we can't control them all. So how do we design our businesses to incorporate the ability to respond quickly, to be more agile? and to increase our ability to pivot. 
Now, anybody here feel like the number of disruptions are going down? Right? They've increased dramatically. And they've increased for a couple of reasons. One, because our businesses are more global than they've ever been. Our customers and our suppliers are bringing together aspects from their regions in order to bring product or service or transport that allows us to bring in supply, produce product, and move product to market. So although the number of disruptions may not be increasing, our involvement and ability to respond to those has increased because we are so global in nature. Now, it's difficult to say if we can ever control the weather or a port strike or socio or economic crisis, right? Those natural disasters are often out of our control. All we can do is respond. So what we have to do is focus on what we can control. I think we've just seen an amazing case study of controlling what we can control in order to respond to what's happening in the marketplace. Those internal factors, product complexity, narrowing our scope where we can in order to produce more effectively. Now we're also facing a very unique challenge in the marketplace, and that is a transition of our talent. If you look at this chart, the gold color here, and this is from the US Census Bureau, the gold color indicates millennials. So if you were born between 1981 and 1996, you are part of that gold bar. And you see how it's increasing. By 2025, millennials will comprise the majority of the workforce. That's because baby boomers are retiring at record rates. Well, here's the thing. Supply chain grew up with the baby boomers. So baby boomers are more likely to want to look under the covers and test and validate the technology because they remember when. They remember when there was no technology. They remember when the first implementation of an MRP system was. Millennials, however, are digital natives. They have grown up with more technology in the palm of their hands than ran many businesses 40 years ago. Millennials embrace technology. They look for it to augment how they conduct their business and apply their expertise to be problem solvers. And by the way, most people in supply chain are problem solvers by nature. It's what we do. We look at complex situations, we get out there, we figure out how to make, move, and distribute our products. So we've got a changing workforce, a globalization of our businesses, a variety of other disruptions, and a change in management strategy from simply least cost to increasing our ability to be agile and resilient in an ever-changing market. However, all of our actions don't necessarily support those goals. Today, about 60% of supply chains are designed still for cost efficiency, not resilience. In part, that's because some of the systems that they're using to support the planning of their business don't offer the ability to be agile. They don't offer the ability to plan for a range of outcomes. They're focused on a single outcome, a single inventory policy that is spread like peanut butter across their full product portfolio. So if we want agility, we need to start thinking about our businesses differently. Now, Eric alluded to the fact that I've been in supply chain for a while. Um, what's interesting is I've worked with nearly a thousand executives that have been part of supply chain transformations in their businesses. 
And as we launch those conversations, those um, new initiatives and investments, I often ask what your goal is. What's the goal? Invariably, visibility is always one of the top three goals. We need visibility. We want visibility. We don't have visibility. But the real question is, what will you do with that visibility? Right? How do I transform those insights into actions? After all, it's not enough to report a late order. We want to prevent a late order. Right? So taking that visibility and enabling our organization and our systems to anticipate, predict, and prescribe an appropriate action. Now, there's no question that visibility is a hot button. In fact, PwC tells us that visibility can lead to an 8% increase in revenue. Better visibility translated into action for our business while simultaneously looking at a 7% reduction in cost. That makes an impact, right? 15% improvement in margin contribution. This is why we hear visibility again and again. It also centers around the ability to look at both volumetric measures, what the quantity is, the tonnage, the units that I'm moving, as well as the financial impact of those plans. What does it mean from a top line revenue perspective, a cost basis, and an overall profitability for our business? Because as you move up in your organizations, your conversations pivot to being financial first and volumetric second. When you're in the middle of your careers, often it's volumetric first and financial second. But the net result is we need to have those conversations together. We need the ability to move back and forth between those very important units of measure so that we can talk about the options that are available to us. So here's an example from the DD Tech customer base from Greif. Greif makes large industrial storage goods, big barrels, bins, et cetera. It's a fairly low margin business. It's also a product area where you want to be able to produce close to market because you want to reduce those distribution costs. What they set out to do is increase visibility on a global basis so that they could empower their local execution to be in sync with market demand. So they've increased global visibility, they've synchronized their production and distribution across a portfolio of 60 to 80 different plant locations, and they've driven tangible ROI for their business. What will you do with the visibility that you create? From there, we think about velocity. As we think about building resilience for our business, it's the ability to not just move product faster, produce product faster. It is the ability to make decisions faster. And Igor, you said this almost verbatim, accelerating the decision making, but doing it in a way that gives us greater confidence. Do we trust the systems, our team, the data to produce reliable results for our business. And as we focus on increasing the velocity, I apologize. I have significantly underestimated your results. Please forgive me, but a 45% reduction in inventory deserves a call out. That's remarkable. In the face of significant disruption, they have been able to reorganize their supply chain network, their talent pool, their customer base, dropping a customer who was 40% of their external demand or their um, uh, demand outside of Ukraine, and 
looking at faster lead times, a changing workforce, retraining, supplier disruption, distributor disruption, and an agenda for growth. Pretty remarkable. So what will they do with that visibility, that velocity? Talk about the need to balance risk and reward, right? As supply chain professionals, your job is to take the spaghetti of possibilities and identify the direction to deploy your assets, your working capital, your team, your time to serve your customers in a profitable manner. And as we do that, we're underserving ourselves often. We're creating risk instead of eliminating it. Because the number one area of increased risk in most of your supply chains exists in the spreadsheets that you're using. Now, I'm not taking any names, but I will tell you that the number one supply chain application in the marketplace today, 50 years after the phrase supply chain has been used, is still spreadsheets. And 94% of spreadsheets specifically in this area of supply chain management, contain errors. This is in our control. We may not be able to control the weather, but we control our use of spreadsheets and our ability to replace those spreadsheets with technology. In part, I'm sure that that's why DD Tech has expanded their portfolio, their ability to broaden the problems that they're solving for your business, the power that they're giving you to not just boost your visibility, but to look at the outcomes that you're searching for, to plan for a range of outcomes in your business, and to do that in a fast and reliable fashion. It is in your control to replace these spreadsheets. Your ERP systems are not designed for iterative planning. They are designed for feeds and speeds, data in, data out. Not evaluating a group of variables for your business to help you align your decision-making for the future, right? So we need to augment those technology platforms with purpose-built solutions that allow us to model our business today and what our plans are for the future. 85% of CEOs say that artificial intelligence is gonna transform the way they do business. They are looking for use cases on where artificial intelligence can accelerate their decision-making, streamline their operations. And I'm here to tell you, supply chain is the place to do it. The use cases we're seeing today are nothing short of amazing. And artificial intelligence comes in a lot of different flavors. There's machine learning, there's predictive and prescriptive analytics. What do I predict? How do I respond to that? And of course, there is the large language models with regard to ChatGPT or Microsoft Copilot that we're seeing in the marketplace. By the way, five years, this particular survey, 2022. Right around the corner, they're expecting, anticipating, they need positive use cases, and you are the people to help them get them. When you look at the adoption of ChatGPT, it took only five days to reach one million users. And within two months, 100 million users. Now you might ask why? Those numbers are crazy from an adoption perspective. But the reality is they have changed the paradigm. These large language models, generative AI solutions 
have changed the way we interact with technology. For decades, we have been forced to learn the language of the computer systems. Now we're removing the barrier and the computer systems have learned how to interact with our languages, how we can talk and get a response. And that builds confidence in the systems that we're using. It changes the way we interact, the way we respond, and the speed with which we're able to make better decisions faster with greater confidence. Think about that for just a moment. You know, in 2017, my husband, who is not a high-tech guy, got a Amazon Dot. You might remember these. They were a little disc. They looked like a hockey puck. 2017, he started asking Alexa a variety of questions. In fact, at one point, I thought he was having an affair with Alexa. He talked to her so much. But everything from Alexa, please order. Alexa, what's the weather? Alexa, what's on my calendar? Alexa, please schedule. Make a recommendation for me. Look at a reservation. Search the internet and tell me the top five whatever. 2017, for $49, it removed his barrier to technology. We are seeing the same thing happen now today in supply chain. It removes the barrier. You don't have to convince your team, your executives, about supply chain. You don't have to run a report. They can ask a question. In fact, the performance improvements in testing multiple scenarios for our business are a thousand-fold faster. Greater precision, less effort, and results in a way, in a means, that our business community understands. Here's an example. Lenovo, the PC maker, took them six hours to run a production plan. With artificial intelligence in the equation, it now takes 90 seconds. Six hours, 90 seconds. Walmart, doing simultaneous supplier reviews, 2,000 supplier reviews, simultaneously in minutes. And here's the kicker. The suppliers prefer the new chatbot process over the prior human interaction. It gives them greater precision. They know what to expect. The responses are quick. They can make their adjustments. So it has been a win-win for suppliers and for Walmart. 2,000 simultaneous negotiations. Pretty remarkable. So when you think about visibility, you think about velocity of decision making, we also have to think about value. As supply chain professionals, we have been metrics driven for decades. Whether it be looking at line rates, production quantities, units available, raw material available, lead time available. But we need to elevate our conversation about things like driving more profitable growth. How is what we're doing in the plant driving growth for our business, serving our customers more effectively? I want you on the CEO's agenda because your CEO is being pushed for growth, is being pushed for resilience in how you expand market presence and drive profitability. Coca-Cola Beverage Africa. So again, another example here in the DD Tech customer base. Now, some of you are thinking, how hard can it be to predict demand for Coke? It's the number one brand in the world. But that's one brand in their portfolio of more than 40 brands. We're also in a market that has new competition on a regular basis, new flavor profiles, new packaging. 
right? So their portfolio is more than 40 brands, but then that's multiplied by a number of different packaging scenarios, seasonality factors, promotion schedules, and production across some 120, 121 different production lines. Time to market is important. Shelf life is important. So when you look at what they've been able to achieve with a 12% improvement in customer service, that's on time in full, combined with 13% reduction in stockouts, better product availability, faster product velocity in their uh, network, but driving that bottom line of working capital, freeing up money to be invested in other areas of their business. Pretty impressive. So as you think about supply chain of the future, and you think about making the leap, embracing technology more completely, reducing spreadsheet use in your business, I want you to think about aligning with your CEO's goals and objectives. Because the number one item on the CEO's agenda is growth. The second one is supporting that growth but keeping cost in alignment. And we are in a market, a global market today that is seeing increased cost in everything from raw material to labor, to storage, to marketing efforts. Everything has increased in some areas dramatically <clears throat> over the last few years and others a little more programmatically. But look at that third item Improving speed and decision-making quality. We just heard that. A wonderful example of how do we support that decision-making so that we can align our businesses to be more responsive and more resilient in the marketplace. Why I wanted to share this with you is as you look at your next move for your business, as you look at boosting resiliency in your business, I want to encourage you to tie those investments to these drivers. This is what your executive team is looking for. They may not be supply chain experts, that's why they have you. But they understand bringing all of those elements together in the business in order to serve customers well, take care of employees, and grow market share be sure to tie your investments to those goals because resilience delivers and it delivers in a big way. We find that the top supply chain providers in the marketplace when compared to their peers in their industries have 15% less inventory. In addition to that, they're seeing better order performance, but look at that cash to cash cycle. Money out, money in, 35% faster cash to cash cycle. That's extraordinary because that's what frees up working capital to be invested in other areas of the business, whether it's a new distribution center, a new product line, increased hiring, better marketing, whatever it might be, but 35% faster cash to cash cycle if they are, um, Looking at, if they're public, 65% better earnings per share or a 60% better profit margin than their peer because they're combining both that growth, increased revenue with decreased cost and one-tenth the stockouts. That means customer satisfaction is 90% higher. So I wanna encourage you to make the leap. You guys are here together. The first thing I want you to do as you're thinking through lunch today is identify three spreadsheets that you can eliminate. Three, just three. By doing so, you're going to eliminate the risk that they've introduced into your business. And then next quarter, I want you to identify three more and so on and so on. But the second thing I want you to do while you're here for the next day and a half is to network with each other because clearly you're doing some extraordinary things. I just shared three different 
success stories, and I grossly underrepresented what Cormatech has been able to achieve. You are in a position where you are transforming risky inventory to valuable insights, and you're doing that with technology. You're planning more effectively for a range of outcomes for your business. And finally, I want to tell you that it is a great time to be in supply chain. It is exciting. What is coming with uh, innovations and in artificial intelligence in unleashing this wealth of planning capability and systems is unprecedented. It is once in a lifetime, and it's really a great place to be. Thank you. Karen, thanks so much. Uh, questions for Karen? Come on. I'll start asking you for questions. Russell, how about a question? Why do you think there isn't more, and maybe it's the bubbles that I live in, but why do you think there isn't more coverage of the opportunity of machine learning and AI in supply chain? Because I feel like what I always hear about is maybe customer relations stuff or you know, the chatbot answers my questions about my medical conditions. Like mm -hmm. obviously medicine is a big opportunity. There are other opportunities, but it seems like such a natural fit to me um, uh, that it'd be really impactful in supply chain. And I just wonder your thoughts about and why maybe some folks haven't awakened to the opportunity that AI and machine learning represents uh, in the supply chain space. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. The first thing is, you need to realize that a lot of your executive team doesn't understand supply chain the way you do. So sometimes they're hesitant to ask the questions and dig a little deeper beneath the surface. The second thing is machine learning is hard to visualize, right? The fact that our system, our model, can get smarter over time, especially if we resist getting in there and making manual changes or overrides, right? The more we can allow our systems to operate and learn from the outcome to look at the actual results, the smarter they become faster. So resisting that override capability and making sure that your model represents your production and distribution capabilities is really important. This is one area why I think Gen AI is bringing down those barriers. Because the fact is, I was in a SNOP review session, and we were piloting some generation AI capabilities, looking at a problem in the marketplace. And the chief supply chain officer looked at his team and said, I want you to model these couple of scenarios. Come back with me for, with your recommendations. And they said, wait a minute. Let's try the Gen AI approach. So they had already done some training of uh, ChatGPT within their business, tied it to some of their supply chain capabilities, and within 90 seconds came back with three recommendations. And he was able to ask, what are the blind spots in each of these three? And he said, okay, all right, we're gonna go with number two. That's what we'll implement, we're done here. And I was like, wait wait a minute, I, I got to hear this again. How would you have solved that problem in the past? Well, in the past, my very capable team would have gone back, would have done some manual modeling. We would have needed an expert with SQL capabilities and a few reporting capabilities to come back. They would have come back, been ready to give me an answer in about three days' time, wouldn't have been able to get on my agenda until next Monday. We had a lag time of seven days before I could then get an answer. But the ability to make a decision that is directionally correct with a pretty high confidence rate in a matter of a few minutes versus multiple days has completely changed the conversation. And to them, that is what AI is is just that large language model, natural language interface, not all of the math 
that has to happen in order to feed the right solution or the right scenario. So it's really building that understanding that AI, artificial intelligence, comes in a lot of different methods for our business. Because had they not had the ability to recalculate and to leverage machine learning, it wouldn't have been able to produce a range of scenarios and outcomes. But the generational AI or the gen AI capability removed the barrier to that robust capability. And I think we're at this inflection point now that is gonna help us in a variety of ways to make better decisions faster and with greater confidence because as business people, we can ask those questions versus having to have a, a, an SQL expert to run the, run the systems that we're using for our business. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I think that that's a really important distinction. And I think that, that what you're saying reminds me of, I think one of the, for me, the introduction, introduction to AI versus ML wasn't ChatGPT. It was the documentary AlphaGo that came out five or six years, six years ago. ago. Yep. And the, the distinction of, of them having trained a computer by watching so many millions and millions of games of Go and, mm -hmm. and all the moves. And there's that, that point, that amazing point in the, in the documentary. I'm getting chills. Uh, there's an amazing point in the documentary where it makes a move that nobody understands that they kind of make fun of because and it ends up being the ahead. turning yes. point in the game. I just think that, that if you have to get people away from thinking of it as being predictive language models necessarily, and more like, you know, what we'll see with autopilot and stuff like mm -hmm. that. I think that machine learning and its obvious role in supply chain is just... Yep. It's amazing. Well, bias still exists, right? Even though we've had forecast algorithms available to us for 35, 38 long years, long time, right? And a multitude of those, and you can tie them to the life cycle of a product. You can look at a number of different variabilities in that process, but we still have bias. We still have salespeople who are going to, you know, sandbag really? the forecast. Yes, it still happens. But what the technology allows us to do is drain that emotion out of it and look objectively at the data that's available. So if we can resist that tendency to want to override the systematic response and look and let it learn and be more responsive by checking the actuals against the plans and understanding our behaviors and what we do in certain situations, just as you just described, it allows the system to be more automated and to be a better version of the truth to start with before we then apply our market knowledge and creativity in how we use that or the scenarios we choose. I have a follow-up question to that. Yes. Um, since you mentioned learning, I, I think that one of the barriers, but you also say it, the executives don't really understand how the technology works and you can teach the model, but I know that sometimes when I used to implement systems and then someone will say, well, why didn't it tell me to do this thing? It's like, well, first of all, you don't have any business rules to tell it, <laughs> assuming that it's a rule-based model. But even now, if it's AI, you have to, like, it has to have that time to learn. So <laughs> I'm thinking in the situation that you just you know, told us about, yeah, the team can say, hey, this is my question in 90 seconds, I get this answer but how long did it take them to get to that point? And what was the executive support and engagement behind it to say, yeah, we're gonna invest X number of months or X number of years. Do you know what that was? Was it a six month project, a one year project? And then you just turn it on. And right. now it's telling me everything else right now. In the example I gave of sitting in the SNOP, they already had an, uh, an SNOP process. So the process was established, but how they interacted with it, they were trying to leverage um, ChatGPT that had already been trained internally on their business and what the data sources were. About a six month investment, but didn't make any changes to the actual applications or databases that they were accessing. So within six months, it had learned enough that in specific scenarios has been able to accelerate that decision-making process. And that was one of their first use cases. Since then, 
That particular situation was about four months ago. Since then, it has learned faster and faster and faster. It hasn't replaced a single individual, by the way. It has augmented them and their ability to make an impact on the business and spend less time as data jockeys and more time as supply chain analysts in looking at the future and how to align their business. So six months investment, it's, in, it's incredible. <laughs>